Okay, so I'm going to start by welcoming you um, all this evening to the Caritas Consciousness Project. And uh, I'll just uh, do a little introduction uh, for people on YouTube who will be seeing this later. Um, my name is Gloria Quedu, and Caritas is dedicated to promoting the evolution of consciousness as the key to individual growth and global healing. We do this through online interviews and presentations by guest speakers, classes, and study groups. We draw from a wide assortment of both ancient wisdom and leading edge studies in science, consciousness, spirituality, and philosophy. We've been doing this for going on 19 years, uh, but in 2019, we began recording our presentations and our video recordings are viewable through our website. Uh, you go to the Caritas, Con um, sorry, CaritasCenter.org is our website. And you just uh, click on the tab that says video library and you can see uh, our videos there or you can go to our YouTube channel, which is Caritas Consciousness Project. Um, and when you, when you put in Caritas Consciousness Project in the search um, box, then you have to click on it when it comes up. Otherwise, you get a lot of other videos mixed in. So as a nonprofit organization, we do rely on the support of our members and donors to keep our program going. If you enjoy our presentations and would like to support this program, you can make a donation or become a member on our website. Memberships start at just $10 a month and we really appreciate them. So now let me introduce tonight's guest speaker. For 20 years, Emmy award-winning journalist, Jennifer Weigel has been interviewing and investigating mediums and psychics and healers. She, gave, she became particularly interested in this topic after the death of her father in 2001. Jennifer won an Emmy for her on-camera reporting for CBS and has also worked for ABC, NBC, WGN, TV and radio, and WLS. Her popular prod podcast, I'm Spiritual, damn it, ran on WGN+. Plus for several years. And her most popular interviews from that podcast can be found on her YouTube channel. She was a wellness columnist, reporter, and video producer for the Chicago Sun-Times, and can now be heard having inspiring conversations with her weekly podcast, The Jen Weigel Show. Jen also hosts the Spiritual Social Club, where she interviews authors and gurus from across the country once a month. Uh, you can see the tab on her website. And her one-woman show, I'm Spiritual Damn It, had two successful runs on the Chicago stage. And uh, her books are, uh, the one I read is um, called Psychics, Healers, and Mediums. Uh, a Journalist, A Road Trip, and Voices from the Other Side, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed every minute of it. It was great. But she has three other books. One is called Stay Tuned, Conversations with Dad from the Other Side, which is the next one I'm going to read because I'm interested in that one. Um, and This Isn't the Life I Ordered, Setting Sail When Your Relationship Fails is another one. And the last one, I'm Spiritual, Damn It. How to Keep Your Feet on the Ground and Your Head in the Stars. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you all for making some time and for inviting me. My pleasure. I'm so glad that you could be here with us today. And uh, I'd like to get started by um, asking you to tell us a little bit about how you became interested in this topic um, and uh at one time, you were a journalist for a Chicago, the Chicago Sun Times, um, and you know, was it were you already interested in this at that time, or um, what were you 
what was what kind of news did you cover during that? So time? before the Sun Times, I was actually a columnist for the Chicago Tribune as well for I think ah. five years. Uh, I had a column called Lessons for Life. But before any of that, um, I was just doing my thing, uh, being a first. It was entertainment reporter. Um, this is kind of the journey that's described and stay tuned. I, I just wanted to be a reporter and do my thing and live my life and get married mm-hmm. and have a kid and, you know, like just have a life and a car and maybe a house in the suburbs and just that'd be fine. And then everything turned upside down when my dad died of a brain tumor at the age of 56 and I was only 30 and he was sort of like um, Ron Burgundy from Anchorman, you know, like he was this cheesy, bigger than life, TV personality, actually a sportscaster in Chicago. And he was at the prime of his life and, and just boom, then he was gone. And so I was a skeptic and I thought that I was going to write a book about these, you know, charlatans and go out and interview as many of them as I could and compile all this data and be this investigative journalist and then write an expose, you know, maybe just do an article here and there, like something for, you know, the New Yorker or, you know, Vanity Fair. And and I just, you know, I had no interest in writing books. And I was sitting with a woman who is actually, um, may she rest in peace now, uh, Laura Caldwell, wonderful author, who is a lawyer turned crime novelist, you know, writing books like Red, White, and Dead, you know, and (laughs) she had years as a, as a trial attorney. And and she, she said to me, as I was telling her some of these stories, because I, I, I was going and I, couldn't explain all of these things that were happening. So while I was trying to call them all frauds, I was so blown away by the stuff that they knew Mm -hmm. because as as a journalist, I wasn't telling them my last name. This was before Google. You know, I would, I would call from a different phone to make my appointment. So that if they tracked it, I mean, we're talking this is back in the time Mm -hmm. of like pay phones, Mm -hmm. you know, I was really, really doing my due diligence to make sure they couldn't find out my, my full name and do any research on me. And then I, you know, I'm scratching my head going, how do they know these things? Well, now I know 20 years later, it's because there are people that are wired with incredible six sense of capabilities. The time Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about it. So I fell into this out of my grief and out of my doubt and my skepticism. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I decided that life is short and I walked away from my TV career at the top of my game at CBS. And I, everybody said it was crazy you know, when you decide to do something that's so against the tide at the mm-hmm. time, it makes no sense. But thankfully, I just knew in my heart that it was wrong and I needed to just follow my heart and tell stories that matter because it was getting to the point where I was, you know, that reporter on the expressway when it's raining out saying it's raining out back to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's snowing back to you. The world yeah. is awful back to you. And then 9-11 hit. And when I went into the newsroom and my news director looked at me and said, we think they're hitting the, the Sears Tower, which is now called the Willis Tower. The tall. We think they're hitting their necks, get in, the, you know, get in the truck and go. Like he wanted me to go where they thought planes were going to hit. Oh my God. And I'm like, you go. I'm not going, you go. You know, I mean, it was just that moment of, are you serious? This is, this is how we're going to roll now. It's about being first. And, and that just sort of really hit me between the eyes that like I was not meant to be in the mm-hmm. it leads, it leads news anymore. And so I made a huge life change. And, and, and then with that, I started telling stories that were true to my heart. So then that's when I circled back into it and started doing the podcast. And then I had the column with the Tribune and then the wellness column with the Sun Times. And so I was kind of beating to my own drum, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in your book, when you go to interview one of these mediums or psychics or healers, you bring someone who they don't know and right. who you haven't introduced mm-hmm. uh, just on the assumption that they can always Google you at this point, but they can't Google someone they don't never heard of. Right. Exactly. So that exactly. was a very good uh, technique. Always yeah. a journalist. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I always want, and I want the reader too to be a skeptic because so, so what I would bring with me, I like, I remember Rebecca Rosen, she's so fabulous. She's out in Colorado and, um, and, you know, I brought my best girlfriend, Melissa from, I've known her since I was 13. And, you know, the night before we were at dinner and the waiter messed up our order and brought like 
dessert first I mean, or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something very specific where the order was messed up. And Rebecca says, you know, oh, did something happen with dinner last night where they brought the wrong thing? You know, and I was like, shut the front door. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> it was really cool. So yeah. yeah, there were a lot of instances like that. <laughs> so as a child, you frequently had premonitions about people and places that weren't very well received. Um, well, you know, it's interesting, not frequently, I have to I'll be honest, maybe frequently they happened, but I only remembered a few, right? And when you're when you're a kid, and you're feeling a hunch on something, and you tell somebody that you think is going to believe you, and they shut you down. Mm-hmm. That like right there was just like, okay, this is wrong. This feeling I have is wrong. I better stop doing this now. So yeah. The, so I stopped talking about it. So it wasn't something I frequently talked about. So I'm so sorry to interrupt. But yeah, I feel no, this, is a, this is a tragedy right now that's happening in our world with kids that are getting hunches on things. And our logical third dimensional mind is like, whatever. And yeah. then they're not feeling. And I know that feeling. It's an awful feeling. And you feel yeah. like you're something you're doing something wrong, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I've heard so many accounts of this from, you know, different mediums and uh, who as children were made to feel like yeah. there was something wrong with them. And, you know, I think of uh, the the first book that Rosemary Altea wrote, you know, the British medium, she mm-hmm. wrote a book called the Eagle and the Rose. Mm-hmm. And when she was a little girl, she, she, she talked to spirits all the time and, and her parents told her that she would end up in the insane asylum like her, aunt or her great aunt or somebody in the family uh, who was a medium and ended up there. And she was terrified and she thought there was something terribly wrong with her. And so she just went underground with it. And so many, you know, um, James Van Prague had a hard time, you know, so many mediums who are children um, in, in Brazil uh, in the spiritist community, if a child, uh, you know, has these abilities, uh, they take them to a spiritist center. And if the child is struggling with it, like seeing negative things or something, uh, they shut them down temporarily until they're older. And then they can decide, do you want to open this back up? Mm. You know, Um, but if they're not struggling with it, then they just train them. You know, it's, exa- it's so interesting you bring that up. So I do these Zoom spiritual social club things but because mm-hmm. I started it with the pandemic. We couldn't be live like we wanted to be every month. So I started these 15 people, 10 to 15 people, intimate Zooms with different healers, psychics and mediums. And everybody gets time with the expert. And it's been a, a huge success. You know, like when you you hit something on all cylinders, people are like, oh, I want to do this, you know, because some of these big things in auditoriums, people pay $100 and there's 300 people there or a thousand people there and they might get to five people. I'm like, no, no, no. Everybody gets time with the expert. And there's a healer from Brazil named Prajna Avalon that James Van Prague and Kelly White, another wonderful medium um, who had a head injury. You know, she was a corporate person that had head trauma. I find a lot of people I interview become intuitive through trauma, either psychological or physical, but they told me about Prajna and she was raised in Brazil. And from Mm -hmm. the time of her birth, she was given energy healing and, and doing psychic development from the time she could walk and talk. Mm -hmm. She didn't know of any other way to be. Mm -hmm. And then she came to the United States and was working in, in actually in, in Massachusetts at Cambridge Hospital. Like she would walk into rooms and blow out the light bulbs because she was so not used to our energy versus how she was raised in Brazil. She had to learn how to rework that whole, you know, mm-hmm. talk about like her electromagnetic field was just <laughs> blowing yeah. things out. So I found that fascinating. Yes, I would, you know, be so fascinated to see what Brazil, you know, they're so nurturing with this, so nurturing. Yeah, it is. And there is, there is definitely, not only is it just accepted, um, but it's also, there is a higher energy there. I've noticed it myself mm-hmm. when I do healing work there, as opposed to here, I get all these crazy things happening. I get a lot more, you know, just interactions with spirit and, and that kind of thing. Uh, right. when, when I do, um, yeah, in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Uh, but especially in the spiritist centers, those are really powerful. Mm-hmm. 
um, and the one I was affiliated with for a long time um, is still thriving. It's just that I haven't been going. Um, and uh, that one has, it's in Rio, and it has uh, about over 3,000 mediums who work there. Oh and, my. and they all work for free because that's part of the spiritist philosophy is you don't charge for mediumship or um, healing work. Mm -hmm. So it's quite inspiring. That's what inspired me to start our center years ago. Wow, good for you. Uh, anyway, um, so I think that uh, it, it is lamentable. This, uh, and I and I hope that as the veil gets thinner, which it is doing, uh, more and more adults will start to understand, uh, be more understanding when their kids, you know, elicit these. Uh, these abilities and um, and as people as more and more people develop their own faculties and journalists like you report to the public that these paranormal abilities are real and all the benefits that they can bring to people you know people who are grieving people who need help people who need healing yeah um, you know in in Brazil um, many of the mediums who are also scientists and, and um, medical researchers, doctors, psychologists, spiritual teachers, um, they use their mediumship to inform the public about developments in these areas so that the spirits on the other side channel through them and tell them, you know, uh, mm -hmm. things. And, and so it's not... Um, they're not about proving that it's real. They're right. It's, it's already accepted. Yeah. I mean, I wish we could get more like that. You know, I've met a lot of MDs lately, doctors who've had mm -hmm. um, experiences that are obviously paranormal. And, and mm -hmm. there's the, you know, group of them where they kind of meet on the side, but, oh, let's not talk about it too much. Right. And, no, they're afraid to. They're afraid yeah. to. I remember reading about a doctor and I can't remember his name now, but he's a, a neurosurgeon and, um, and he, at one point, he stopped teaching mm -hmm. and he had this reputation where he never lost a patient and, and he was teaching. And at one point he stopped teaching and someone asked him why. And he said, because I can't teach what I do when I sit down, when I go to see a pa or a patient comes to see me, I can, there was something that he could read energetically around mm -hmm. the patient's head. And, and I, I don't remember the details of exactly what it was, but he said, you know, so that tells me whether I can safely operate on this, on this person or not. And if, if I see that I can't, then I don't. And if I see that it's a green light, then I do. And he said, there's no way I can teach that to my students. Right. Well, right. it was too frustrating. I had to stop teaching. I write about in my second book, uh, I'm Spiritual Dammit, I run into an old high school friend and he admits to me uh, over a three martini lunch, maybe four martinis, I can't remember at the time, but he admits that he is, um, Got it. he can see colors around people and that that's how he does business and that's how he, you know, functions. And I thought, Are you kidding me? Like the captain of the soccer team sees auras, what? And yeah. I just was amazed by it. Yeah, and yeah. that's how he did all of his business. And he got to vice president of his company by trusting the color around uh, people that he would see if it was purple, it was a go. If it was brown, it was no go, mm -hmm. you know, so very, very interesting. You know, Conrad Hilton talked about the Hilti hunch, you know, that, that's all intuition. And mm -hmm. it's okay if you put it in something like positive thinking, the power of positive thinking, Norman Vincent Peale. But if you talk about, you know, mediums and psychics people think dead chickens and you know globes it's it's not it's not yeah yeah hi susan welcome <laughs> Thank you. um yeah i remember carolyn mace talking on one of her tapes uh about um you know how wall street a lot of wall street executives you know stockbrokers and you know have this uh uncanny intuition and that's what they go by you know Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not limited to, um, you know, the woo world <laughs> that we're in. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, uh, Absolutely. Uh, 
So, um, yeah, so there, I think there are a lot of experts in all kinds of different fields on the other side who could help us, you know, help us with climate change, help us with any number of things if we would just take it more seriously, you know. Yeah, there's a woman named Susan Rowland that I talk to regularly in my spiritual social club, Little Zooms. She's um, next Friday night, uh, May 20th of 2022. She's going to um, address our psychic kids and like our intuitive kids and help them with their toolbox. But Mm -hmm. she talks a lot about the runner angels, she calls them. And she says, they're all in a category. Just pick a category. You need a plumber, get a runner plumber. You need an accountant, get a runner accountant. But just because it's like, if it's all under you know, SOARS, which is God. And then underneath that, it's like, picture the different departments. Like we talked about, you know, you need someone in marketing, you need somebody in PR. Mm -hmm. That's what all these different angels, angels with different skill sets are waiting, but they need to be asked because of free will, you know, unless there's something karmic, they can't intervene without Mm -hmm. being asked. So I always talk to people, you know, ask, Yeah, you never know till you ask. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned that the stigma attached to mediums and psychics in our culture is not as present in Europe, that when right. you were in England, you mentioned to somebody that you were going to see a medium and there was no reaction. Oh, okay. I was like, yeah, okay, cool. See you yeah. later. <laughs> why do you think that is? Why, why do you think Europeans take the paranormal more in stride? Than well, we? I think there's so much more hit the history behind, I mean, Europe, even with like, Ireland and, and Scotland and castles and fairies and uh, the Arthur Finley in, in the UK. I mean, there's an, there, if you have, there's a special on Netflix uh, came out during the pandemic um, surviving death, you know, and they talk a lot about that. Um, and I love that uh, the first episode of that and the last episode, the middle ones get a little weird with ectoplasm and all sorts of weird stuff. Like people are, you know, coughing up weird I don't think you need to do that to prove that something's going on. It's just weird, but they do delve into the whole respect of the university of studying psychic mediumship and how it is an art that needs to be studied, just like going to become and get a degree in business or a degree in accounting or whatever your master's or your MFA or MBA. So they treat it more. There's, there's a structure, I think around it, especially in England around the education that can be given with this. And I think that kind of gives it a little bit more gravitas than say what we have going on here, which I I just came from the Edgar Cayce, uh, you know, uh, their research and association for research and enlightenment in Virginia Beach just there this weekend. And, um, and, you know, thank God for Edgar Cayce at at the turn of the century, early 1900s, a trailblazer for medical intuition and, and, and the, you know, the, the sleeping prophet, or I mean, he's just, thousands and thousands of cases of all this stuff that's documented. Thank goodness for his wife and his bookkeeper that kept those stories alive, but that's really the only organized place. I mean, there are other places that have popped up, Mm -hmm. but we just don't treat it with the same kind of respect. I think that they do over there in Europe. That's just at least my, my experience, my opinion. Yeah, Yeah, I think you're right. And um, I wonder sometimes if it's our Puritan, (laughs) beginnings or oh, for sure i mean salem witch trials anybody yeah. would you know but they had those names too yeah you know, that's the, true that's the, true the church was i think yeah. that's why when spiritualism got to england they made it a church to protect the mediums you know from persecution right. whereas mm-hmm. spiritism mm-hmm. started in france with alan kardec who was a professor of science and math <laughs> And he said, never make this a religion. It's got to be a metaphysical science. Mm-hmm. Research all the time, you know, ongoing mm-hmm. research. And, you know, so it's there is a difference and people yes. confuse the two. He chose a different name in order to differentiate it from spiritualism. But I don't think it was different enough because, yeah. yeah. Um, so how, how do you go about... Um, selecting your subjects, your interview subjects? Um, That's interesting. So I have a trusted group of friends who are healthy skeptics, but they're not cynics. You know, I think there's a difference. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have a good, um, you know, balance of both. Uh, But if you're a cynic, then you've already got a door shut and it's going to take a lot more to pry it open. 
Um, that I, if I find somebody that I think is, you know, what I love finding lately is the people that don't want to be famous. I mean, Mm -hmm. they don't, they don't care to have a TV show. They don't want a book. They don't want to be in front of the camera. They don't want to be the Long Island medium. They are mediums in Long Island or, or Mm -hmm. Milwaukee or wherever, but they have, you know, three kids and five dogs and they just love doing what they're doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and they're so, they even have trouble charging for what they're doing, but because they're spending so many hours and they have to buy diapers and whatever they do now. But so it's, that's what I really love now is finding those people. And I, and I, I like doing conferences with those people, but because they're not in it for like the business side of it, they're in it just to be the healing. <laughs> I call it like herding cats. They're not great with time and space and schedules. <laughs> it's just like, oh my God. Like, can somebody go get the medium out of the lobby? We got to get started. Like, scheduling can be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> they don't live in Boulder, do they? Because, like, yeah. Boulder is famous for. Yes, right. Boulder yeah, town. no, it's interesting. I haven't, I haven't been out that way to find many in Boulder yet. But mm-hmm. I always take every recommendation that people send to me with complete, you know, validity if it's somebody that I respect and I know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have found, unfortunately, that some people are in it for the wrong reasons. And the wrong reasons to me are to be famous and to be, yes. you know, a star. And that to me is the ego needing to fill something. Um, and when, when the ego starts taking center stage, then that's when we kind of part ways. And I've, I've written about some people that I no longer work with just because of that reason. It doesn't mean I don't think they're great mediums. It just means that I have a different path now that I want to go on and connect with some of the people that don't need to be famous, so to mm-hmm. speak. Um, yeah, well, yeah. in Brazil, you know, they say the guides will leave you if mm-hmm. you're doing it for, you know, if you have an agenda and you're doing it for ego purposes, right. The guy, the higher guides will not work with you. You might attract lower ones, but you won't be as accurate and you won't be doing. I've seen, I've seen some people lose their ability because their ego gets so on top of it. And then, then, then this is going to sound really weird, but then it comes back, but I have a feeling it's not from a light source. It's from a dark source. Yep. So the way I explain this to people, yeah, the way I explain this to people now, and this is a new revelation for me recently, but like George Lucas was brilliant in the sense that Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi, they're both very talented and they're both, you know, and Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, but Darth Vader was a really good warrior too, even though he was evil, you know, so evil can be super talented. It's just not coming from the source of Yoda and Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan that I like to come from. I, I want to be in the light always. And, and that I didn't used to know that the dark could be as talented. Yeah. And I had to learn that the hard way through somebody who I, I found out was working with the dark energies because of stuff that ended up happening later. And mm-hmm. I went and like, whoa, that just blew my mind because I didn't think that the dark had such talent. Uh, <laughs> but then I realized, yeah. 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 There's no guarantee just, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it's heavy karma. Yeah, you, know, you misuse these things. You know, right. you know when I started doing healing work, I kind of came to it kicking and screaming because it was not on my agenda at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, and this friend of mine uh, who is um, uh, a clairvoyant and clairaudient medium and a trans medium, he mm-hmm. channeled his guide. Uh, he was interested in in using his gifts for healing. But uh, so he invited me to attend this little group that he had started with just a handful of friends. And, uh, and I started going and uh, I was very resistant to it at first, because I had no interest in it. But then as I started doing it, I realized, oh, my God, Mm -hmm. this is something I am, I have to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, So I'll have days where I wonder, like, really, I left my, you know, news position at CBS to go, you know, follow psychics, mediums and healers and tell (laughs) stories about them. And like, what, where am I, what, where did I go wrong kind of thing? And then I'll get these heartfelt notes from people saying that, I mean, I really pull back the curtain in all of my books. I I don't, you know, to my family's chagrin, they're not always happy about it, but I, I, I'm, I'm flawed. Everybody's flawed. And you have days where you doubt everything. And so the way that I healed through my doubt was to write about it. And then the way I explored and expanded my consciousness was to go on these road trips or adventures or what have you and interview these different site, these different people and, and really absorb it. And like you said, um, Gloria, 
especially in the last book, Psychic Sealers and Mediums, bringing with me a stranger that they couldn't look up ahead of times for the, you know, so that people could see. I, I don't gain, and I say this to people a lot, I don't gain anything by presenting a, a fraud. Like it, it, mm-hmm. it will ruin my reputation. And I like to think that I, I have one because it, it's important to me to be trustworthy. Mm-hmm. Like this is really vulnerable work, healing and, and healing from grief, physical healing, spiritual healing, all of it. If, if you're entrusting, you know, some people have different ways of delivery, like Carolyn Mace will bite your head off. We just did a live event with her and she bit the whole front row's head off and they walked out of there like, (laughs) and then the rest of the people were like, that was amazing. Like everybody has a different way of receiving information and some need that kick in the butt and some really need like a flowery, loving, soft delivery. And I've seen it. Like I've seen somebody do the most incredible mediumship reading to somebody. And they're in such a state of grief that they just didn't hear it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Nope, that's not true. It must be fake. You must have told them all about me. You must have told them that my, you know, they mm-hmm. assume the worst that mm-hmm. I planted the whole thing because they're still in so much grief, you know? And I'm like, no, I would never do that because first of all, that's, I would mm-hmm. never do that. But grief hits everybody differently. And so people hear messages differently and everybody is different, which is another reason why I love to do these social clubs. Cause I tell people, this is like the appetizer before you order a main course to see if you like their style. You might not like that Carolyn Mace delivery. You might want something really sarcastic. You might not want somebody who swears. You might want somebody who's, who's Christian, you know, I mean, they're all, so, so you got to see what they are. It's like test driving a car, <laughs> you know, before you invest in the money. That's yeah. what I tell people. You have to, tra- and even picking a therapist, you've got to go to different therapists and interview different therapists. So everyone is different in how they like to receive their information. So it's been yeah. pretty eye opening for me. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, it, and helps it helps the months. Month so yeah. You yeah. Know, yeah. Before you go to see them. I, I happen to like Carolyn Mace a lot, but then I'm from New York. So it's, <laughs> yeah, no, I love it too. But yeah, it's funny. The feedback from this last uh, event that we did was just mm-hmm. a very intimate group of 40 people. And it was the first live event she'd done since the pandemic in Chicago. She had done mm-hmm. workshops other places, but this is the first one in Chicago. And it was just like, you know, humble up people. It's not about you. And that is such a great message. It's not like you, yeah. everybody has days when things are awful and we don't know what the loss is across the street to your neighbor next door to think that it's about you and woe is me, but I'm a good person. Why isn't it working out? You know, it's not about you. Yeah. Every day should be, you know, I'm going to choose my power of love versus the love of power, yes. you know, and, and the love of power has gotten so out of control. You've got to remember that the power of love is what really matters most. And that was actually what I learned through Edgar Casey's teachings that I was revisiting. Cause of course I heard about him back in the late nineties. And when my dad died a couple decades ago, I was like, Oh, I should look into this guy. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading his books or a few of his books way, way, way back. But I picked up a new one this last weekend, sort of summarizing a lot of his cases. And the through line is the whole point of the soul's journey, according to these channeled readings from Edgar Casey, mm-hmm. is to love and be loved. That's it. Receiving love fully and giving love from a healthy place, not from a depleted place of codependence. We were talking about that, Gloria, before we let the gallery in, but like Mm -hmm. that's, that's called codependent and that's called, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to fix something that's broken, but no, no, to be loved and to give love is the whole point of the soul's journey in this incarnation. That's That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. That is the point. I love there is a river. Uh, that book about Edgar Casey, and have you seen the documentary? That uh, no, I need to. A few people have uh, brought yeah. it up since I got home. Yeah, it's very, it's very beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like it. Um, so a lot of the psychics in in the book that I read, psychics, healers, and mediums, um, did you'd be? Well, people are still joining here. <laughs> uh, you'd be meeting Mister Wright. Did yeah, happen? they did. Didn't they? I kept wondering. I kept waiting for the outcome. Right. <laughs> and I I about, <laughs> Wait, I have to ask her. Well, it's funny. So I, I gave uh, a couple of the um, psychics a little bit of flack for that because they had predicted, you know, and this is such an interesting question. It brings up an interesting question. 
about psychic predictions, right? And and I have mm-hmm. I've said this now as you know, investigating this for 20 years, and people go and see psychics and they're like, Why didn't this happen? You said October, what the heck? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know, I had in that book that you read, you know, mm-hmm. four or five different people saying Mr. Wright was right around the corner. And as a divorced woman, I was like, you know, <laughs> my, my son would make the joke like it's like SpongeBob SquarePants, like 40 years <laughs> later, you know, like that we're still waiting for Mr. Wright. And, um, you know, COVID hit and all sorts of things. Um, so, so no, it, the timing of the psychic mediums were not correct on, uh, on this, this timeline of Mr. Wright happening. Uh, but they still say it's coming, right? It, like, in other words, here's what I have concluded with these predictions and timelines. Timelines, time and space is irrelevant because the other side doesn't have the same calendar that we have. Yeah. But if it's in our destiny to work at a certain place or meet a certain person, have kids, live in a certain climate, whatever. I feel like we have these destiny points that we're supposed to hit throughout our incarnation Mm -hmm. and that our guides and angels and, uh, you know, team on the other side will do all that they can to align us so that we meet those destiny points. Mm -hmm. And the timing might be off by a year or two here and there and free will comes into play Mm -hmm. so that, um, So I asked Rebecca Rosen about it and she said, so what we all saw as a trajectory when you were writing that book was was somebody who was like right here, but then something happened over here. This person went back there, in comes another, you know, free will moved a lot of moving parts. So it's like when a storm hits and then all the leaves fall and they land on the driveway in a different pattern. And so I still think it's my destiny point to in my, you know, as I call it, I'm in my back nine, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the golf tournament. I'm in the back nine holes. I don't know that I'm going to be solo, but I'm really okay if that is for my highest good. Because every day I wake up with that intention. I say, show me the next steps for my highest good and the highest good of all involved. No matter what it looks like, help me trust it. And so mm-hmm. it is. And then mm-hmm. I move forward. And then I know it's not about me because you know what? I had a great partnership and I have a beautiful son. So I'm, I'm luckier than many so I have to look at it of what I have instead of what I don't have in this current time. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot to be in this exploring this world, right. Of intuition and, mm-hmm. and trying to build up my library of my database of all the different people I interview. And that's not something that every partner wants to be along for the ride with. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's going to take a certain personality that's really okay with my going to the Edgar Casey Institute in Virginia mm-hmm. beach or, you know, heading over to Peru to see Machu Picchu or whatever. Not everybody wants to go on those road trips and that's okay. I'm really okay with that. But so, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just curious. Just yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, one of the things I enjoyed so much in your book was the humor mm-hmm. and, and it really helps to see humor in this work and take ourselves lightly as you were saying earlier and not, you know, not be all about me, but uh, which medium was it? Was it, um, oh, what was his name? Was it Paul Selig? Um, Paul Selig, yeah. Uh-huh. Who said um, uh, who I am, what I am and how I serve something mm-hmm. like that. Yes, yes, exactly. I can't yeah. remember his exact quote, but that was his channel. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I realized I, I know I, who I am. I know what I am. I know how I serve. Yes, yeah, that's it. That's, mm-hmm. Yeah. I really and now he's changed it to, I know who I am now. I know what uh-huh. I am now. I know how I serve now. So uh-huh. now it's like even more ramped up. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I really loved that chapter on Paul. And, and I actually had Paul, uh, he presented at Caritas when we had our center years ago. Nice. And I was fascinated by, how he channels, you know, that double kind of voice, you know, that yes. one. And uh, it, it's really, uh, I, I've never seen anyone do that. And I thought he has to be authentic because why would anyone <laughs> do right. that? Why would anyone subject themselves to be taken over by an energy, you know? And I sat across from him as we were doing that conversation at, at uh, WGN Studios, and it was like he was talking to him. <laughs> And he was talking, yeah. about, and like his head would turn slightly, and then he would come out really fast. And, go, exactly. and he could yeah. see his incense. So I it was like he was repeating what he said, repeating what he said. And, yeah. and so, and you're just kind of watching this theater sort of happen, and yeah. different guides have different cadences and tempos for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. It's fascinating. And, um, but I, I love what he says. And that's the bottom line. I mean, he's very, you know, he talks about love and non-dual, non-duality. And, you know, it, it really, I think uh, of all the, um, I think of all the chapters in the book, uh, he and Carolyn Mace were the two that I found most profound yeah. in, in what they talked about. Uh, yes. I was I, I was very happy, and I thought, oh yeah, I remember him. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was fascinated by how he did that. Yeah, and, and he was, left New York, and now he lives in Hawaii, and he said it's like the best thing he's ever done. I mean, just uh, the pandemic, you know, cha- caused a lot of people to you know sort of reevaluate and go, if I could live anywhere, where would it be? Yeah. Hawaii. So that's where he went. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about. Yeah, um, a funny story that we had that I had uh, years ago when we had our little healing group in in upstate New York. Um, the uh, my friend who was the the clairvoyant and clairaudient and all that uh, he he would get messages, you know, for for us. And one day during the um, during the meeting, he said, you know. I keep seeing fire and I'm afraid one of us, you know, somebody in this group is going to have a fire. And, you know, cause I keep seeing, I see hands like this um, holding like a blanket mm-hmm. and, um, and I, I just, I don't want to alarm anybody, but I forewarned is forearmed. So I'm just letting you know uh, that uh, for the last couple of weeks, I've been, whenever I'm with you guys, I see this. And um, so we were all, you know, worried and checking our furnaces and doing all this stuff. And, right. and then one day, um, his, uh, his, his heater in his home, um, his, wa- I guess it was his water heater, they had put it inside a stairwell, a closed stairwell, and it just exploded. And mm-hmm the whole, you know, the house was burning all around and, and he grabbed a blanket and he's doing this and suddenly he realizes it was his. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, was, it was his house. And, and so the following week he came to the meeting and he told us and we were all so relieved, yeah. but, you know, so they don't always know, mm-hmm. you know, they don't always know the details. They don't always know, um, you know, the timing is the hardest thing I think. It is really the hardest thing. Well, I I do think that, you know, some people get so dependent on, you know, the information coming from outside themselves that then they, you know, the really good ones, I feel like will put up a boundary and say, no, we just talked, you know, three months ago, Mm -hmm. go live your life, you know, live your life with a good intention and you will be guided accordingly, you know? Um, And, and so, yes, I remember Echo Bodine saying something about how, you know, she was told that she was going to marry somebody that she was a friend of her brother's or somebody she already knew, and it was going to be in a certain month. And, you know, I think it was 11 years later that she married <laughs> that person on that October or whatever that, that or November. And uh, it was somebody that her brother did know, but, you know, it was 11 years after the fact. And so it took a long time for those pieces to come together. Right. So, um, and you know, I think that that's probably, not such a bad thing because mm-hmm. we right. shouldn't get dependent on those kinds of things. We should follow our guidance and take, put one foot in front of the other and do right. what we need to do and what we came to do and not worry about the details. Exactly. exactly. Um, so uh, let's talk about pre-birth choices. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned it in um, in an interview that I saw. I don't remember the name of the interviewer, but uh, you were talking about that. And I thought that's a, a topic that I love uh, because I think it's so important. It changes how we see ourselves and how we see the things that so, you know, supposedly happen to us um, so that we're not feeling victimized you know, by the things that happen in our lives when we realize it's one of the things that spiritism uh, teaches is how before each incarnation, uh, we 
we have been reviewing the previous incarnation and what we learned and what we still need to learn. And we sit down with our guide and we, you know, think about what we want to take on in the next incarnation and the circumstances uh, and the people that are going to facilitate that. And, um, yeah, one, one person um, who we had, uh, who did a presentation on that, and he's wonderful, is Rob Schwartz. Do you know him? I don't know Rob, but I've heard of Rob. But yeah, put his name down because he's, okay. he's wonderful. He's mm -hmm. really, really excellent. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that's just a, a very important thing to know. Well, it's, I, I first, the first time I heard about it, I remember James Van Krog talked about it and he was like the very first big name in this kind of space that I interviewed while still working at CBS. And I write about that in stay tuned, my first book. Um, he literally came to town. He was, he was promoting reaching to heaven, which was after talking to heaven, his first bestseller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nobody in Chicago wanted to interview him. And I had blown through talking to heaven and I was, I was really happy with reaching to heaven. And it took a lot of convincing to my producer to even let me do the interview. And she thought, well, okay, he has a New York times bestselling book. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here he was in my living room and my, my father-in-law, my, my ex-husband's dad had just passed away. And he said something about South, South, and he was from South Bend. So, you know, he got that. But one thing that even we didn't know, I didn't know, and my husband at the time didn't know, is that my ex-father-in-law had changed something with the will to, ben to benefit the family. Uh, James said that to me, and I didn't even know. And I took the VHS tape, this is how long ago it was, mm -hmm. to my mother-in-law in South Bend, Indiana, and play she played it, and she walked into the bedroom, and she shut the door, and she didn't come out for a while. It was just kind of blew her Catholic circuits. She didn't know what to make of this. And uh, she would always joke with me that I was going straight to, <laughs> to hell, straight to the fiery inferno for even talking to people like James Van Brock. But he had mentioned something about choosing our parents. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and then it was Don Miguel Ruiz for agreements author. I interviewed him and he was talking about that too. And, mm -hmm. and sort of, so a bunch of different people saying that we, yeah, we choose like a syllabus, like we sit down with our guide and our team and, and it's like, we go through and, now, from what I understand, it's these life challenges that we want to master. So mm -hmm. apparently in my family, I want to master narcissism and mm -hmm. addicts <laughs> and all these things, because these are repeat challenges that keep coming in through generation after generation. And I believe we have this ability, if we want to choose love, to do differently and not repeat the patterns and stop that cycle. Mm -hmm. We can choose to stop that cycle and so we choose these tasks like warriors when we're making our syllabus before we're even born mm -hmm. of what we want to take on and who's going to be the cast of characters while we write and produce and direct our movie and star mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. own movie. And that takes me out of, you know, victimhood, right? Mm -hmm. You go from victorious, yeah. from victimhood to victorious, right? So, um, so that changed things a lot for me once I, once I, and, and having interviewed now so many people who have died and come back, mm -hmm. that's another thing where I say, look, I've talked to a lot of people who have been over there. I'm going to trust them <laughs> over me because yeah. they've been there. I haven't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have an entire audio book just on interviews with uh, called Doctors and Near-Death Experiences. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's on Audible and you can find it. Mm -hmm. But it's just, I really, and I love those conversations because to me, if you've been over there and you came back, you're going to have a filter that I do not have. And a lot of times that return brings mm -hmm. on a lot of intuitive abilities that you didn't have before mm -hmm. because of the trauma. And, um, and that's just fascinating. Your perspective on yeah. your life. And, um, and there are so exponentially more of those accounts these days because of the uh, advances in resuscitative techniques you right. know, so we're resuscitating that many more people. And so we hear these accounts. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And the other thing that we recently had, uh, William Peters, who does uh, shared death. Yes. He's a researcher on shared death experiences, which yeah. he calls soul crossings, I think. And, uh, and that's, that's, you don't have to almost die. You can, you know, be with a loved one who 
is dying and accompany them in the yes. initial stages of the journey. And that is mm -hmm. just as profound as some of these near-death experiences. I will connect you to Dr. Jeffrey O'Driscoll if you haven't had a conversation with him yet. No, nothing. I, I don't know that. Great. Name. He was uh, an ER physician for 25 years, and he wrote the book, Not Yet. And he had many shared death experiences in the ER when he would see the spirit leave the body. And um, he was working on one, you know, or actually watching the team work on one patient, uh, Jeffrey Olson, who's had a lot of near-death experience, well-known books. Knowing is one of them. And um, he, he, Jeffrey Olson's wife was standing right there by the body and Dr. Jeff could see. So, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, if you're having those visions, you must be, you know, lacking oxygen or it's the drugs. And Dr. Jeff is like, um, I was working my shift when I was seeing that. So, yeah. so yeah, he's a shared death experiencer uh -huh. and um, right. wonderful, wonderful book, wonderful man. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fascinating field. I hadn't really thought much about. Mm -hmm. Until until uh, inviting William Peters and reading his book, I uh, really uh, and I realized that I'd had a couple of them myself, but yeah. I just never thought of it in those terms, you know. True. So, yeah, you know, I was fascinated too, Gloria, when you talked about how you, you know, with the spiritism and helping souls that might be stuck. Mm -hmm. I, I never had experienced that before, but one time I was sitting with a woman that, and I write about her in my first book and my second book, another great guest for you. Her name is Dr. Therese Rowley. Um, and she wrote a book called Mapping a New Reality. And she's one of 11 kids. She's been able to see both sides of the veil and she would see spirits leave their body. And, and all, she could see dark, you know, auras around people and see people's intentions and, and contracts that people would give away power in different chakras and all sorts of different things. But she's a, she got her PhD at Kellogg here in, in Chicago at Northwestern University. So she's, you know, not, not airy fairy, as you say, right? She's, mm -hmm. she's in business, but she's got this ability with the sixth sense. And we were sitting and having lunch and I was, I suddenly, it was the weirdest thing. I saw this like little girl mm -hmm. and it was sort of like this movie was playing out next to us while we were eating. And I'm like, what the heck is happening? And I explained it to Therese what was happening. And I asked her, you know, am I just having a moment here? Am I, am I sleep deprived? What's going on? And she confirmed and looked into it. And, and it was that it was a, a soul that was lost. She had been um, either wherever we were eating. It's like her soul was trapped in the basement of one of these little houses. And it was like, she had a terrible passing. And I mean, I could see the, mm -hmm. the sad little girl. And then, so she did this thing and and the next thing you know, the little girl skipping and goes into the light. And it was like, mm -hmm. it, so that was a sort of shared death experience. That was the only time I've had anything like that happen so far mm -hmm. where it was, a sh I, I got to see the shared crossing. And then as supposedly this little spirit went into the light, the sun, like we were sitting and it's just like, boom, uh -huh. just came, like this bright sun. And it was just this kind of like, whoa. And I just went, I, I can't explain this. Mm -hmm. I, I can't explain this to anybody. I don't know. There are not many people you can have that conversation about, but it was a wonderful. And then, and then we just felt this lightness and we felt this love pour over us. And it was just, mm -hmm. it was just wonderful. And so mm -hmm. when you explained that you helped do that, I didn't even believe that was a possible thing until I sat and had that lunch with Dr. Rowley mm -hmm. and, and had that shared sort of experience with that that yeah. sweet little girl. So, yeah. it, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of energy here that we can't even begin to understand with only using a small percentage of our brain. Right. Imagine what else we could figure out if we used more of our brains. Yeah, I, I would say that's, I mean, I don't know when the little girl had died, how long she was stuck in this basement. Yeah. Um, it, it, it could have been more of a, an after death communication. Right. Um, uh, the the shared death experience, which is just as powerful, mm -hmm. you know, right. uh, the shared death experience usually happens when the person either just before mm -hmm. or during or I just see, or they're passing. I see. Gotcha. Yeah. This was a stuck. This was a stuck spirit. I think that yeah. was the light. Yes. It was yeah. a stuck mm -hmm. spirit mm -hmm. who needed help. Yeah, you exactly. That, uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's fairly rare that a child needs help, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, we've had them in our disobsession work occasionally where the child didn't want to cross because couldn't find her mother and, you know, that right. kind of thing. And uh, so, yeah, 
Um, so one of the things that Thomas John says in your book, uh, he's one of the mediums that you interview, and he said that his gifts became much more pronounced when he decided it was time to use them to help people. Mm -hmm. uh, do you hear that a lot? Because I have... Also. I have heard that a lot. Yes. And when, when actually, and when people own into it, that they want to use them for good, for the greater good. Exactly. And, you know, and once you say, you know, I just tell people show up in service, whatever that looks mm -hmm. like. And everyone's going to have a different special spidey skill. Some people are great at QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. Some people are great at connecting. Some people are great at hosting parties. Some people are wonderful at parallel parking. Like mm -hmm. everybody's got a different skill and whatever it is that you do and you do well, mm -hmm. I think the universe wants you to do it a lot. And, and if it is, you know, I know Carolyn Mace always says this, she came into the world with a gift that she had no desire Mm -hmm. to utilize, which is medical intuition. She wanted to be a book editor and live in, you know, the woods of New Hampshire and, you yeah. know, sip a cup of coffee in front of the fire. But the next thing you know, she's seeing people, you know, working with Norm Sheely and decades later, there you go. Yeah. So sometimes um, you might not be excited about what you're really good at, but I think if you're really good at something, that's the universe and God's way of saying, you know, it's, it's time to show up. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what my journey was with healing. I really wasn't interested, but this friend of mine who, you know, who's a medium and mm -hmm. he kept telling me, you know, you've got to, you, you, you've got to do healing work. It's, mm -hmm. it's in the cards for you. And I'd say, mm, you know, right. you don't know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> and then he and I were interested in astrology and we were taking these astrology uh, classes and going to this discussion group right. and, um, and every time an astrologer would look at my chart, they would say, oh, you're a healer. And I'd say, no, I'm not. Right. And it was really funny. And, and finally, then uh, I'd heard it from so many people that I decided, you know, I think I really need to um, open the door. Right. So what I said to the forces that be was, okay, if you want me to do healing, you just have to have to bring it to me because I'm busy. I have three kids. I'm right. not, I don't know what kind of healing I'm supposed to be doing. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go out looking for some kind of healing work to do, or, or I'm not going to start going to school, you know? Right. Um, right. And so I, I'm open. And I, I decided I, at that time, I was not in the, um, I was not in, in the uh, practice of praying before mm -hmm. I went to sleep at night, right. but I thought to myself, well, I will um, say this little prayer mm -hmm. before I go to bed every night. And, uh, and that's all I'm doing. That's, that's my sign that I'm opening the door right. and I'm not doing anything else. I'm not right. going to start reading books on healing or anything else. And uh, this was in the late 70s. And, uh, you know, energy healing was hardly known at all at that time. Oh, for sure. I yeah. heard of it. And then he was my friend, you know, John was talking about energy healing, and I had no concept of what he was talking about. And, and, um, and then, you know, he, he said, well, come and check this out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to check it out. And that was when it clinched for me because, well, f at first I just liked the group. So right. I, I, I kept going. And then when I finally started actually working, you right. know, um, and I, and I was introduced to my guide um, <laughs> who eventually taught us the modality that, that we were learning. And then I went to Brazil because I had to heard about John had given me this book, the spirits book on spiritism. And so I thought, well, I'm going to go down and see family. So I'm going to check out a spirit to center. And, and then it turned out that they, the, the work that they did was identical to the work that my guide had taught us. And so that was a huge confirmation because I had no idea that that's what well, you we followed thought. the breadcrumbs, you know, if, if you put yeah. yourself out there and say, so for me now, I, I say to my team, all right, I need it in threes. It's mm -hmm. got to come. If, if, if it's three times, that's an anvil over the head and I will follow. Mm -hmm. No, no problem. But you know, the first time it's just kind of like a whisper. The second time is a gentle, 
nudge in the shoulder. And the third time, like that, that just recently happened for me with horses of all things. Oh, wow. I was, I, somebody brought up horses and I love horses, but I hadn't been on a horse farm since my teens. You know, my uncle had a farm, my grandpa had a farm, but I hadn't been on a horse farm. Somebody brought up, you know, me going up to a horse farm. I thought, well, I love horses. That'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks later, I went to another horse farm. And then the third time somebody said, you know, you need to meet my friend at this horse farm. I was like, okay, okay. We'll come up with with horses. So Mm -hmm. now I do these events once a month called Lessons and Lunch. And it's like-minded people getting together and and exchanging that energy. There's nothing quite like the energy exchange of human and horse. I mean, the horse really feels your every, every breath, you know, and, um, so it gets you back in your body. It gets you out of your mind and into your spirit. And it, and it's so I, I took that power of three, you know, I, I so I, I suggest to people a lot, if you're busy, we're all busy, but if something comes in threes, stop and take notice. Yeah. And it might be something. So, what do you do? Do you, do you gather with horses? In- so there's a horse. The third person told me to go meet this woman who has a horse farm just an hour North of Chicago beautiful mm-hmm. place called the Dietrich farms. And so we gather, you know, it's an eight to 10 person maximum. We mm-hmm. all get together and we kind of talk about our experience and where we are and how we feel and what we hope to get out of the day. Then we mm-hmm. go into the arena um, and, and have a lesson. And then we come back into the house and have like an intuitive lesson. This last one was about opening your intuition. The one before that was about crystals and and healing the one before that was essential oils, but there's always a lesson with the horse and then a lesson with some sort of wellness I incorporated see. it. And so we kind of just joined forces and, and it's been lovely. Mm. When things are a flow, I say it's a go, you know, mm. like when things just come together, I am finding now with the veil thinning, you were saying or, uh, earlier, you know, the veil is thinning. And so when synchronicities come into play and things lock in, mm-hmm. you know, there's nothing worse than when you keep knocking on a door and knocking on a door and knocking on a door and your knuckles get bloody and you're like, but I was told in my meditation, I'm supposed to be right here right now. No, mm-hmm. if you were, mm-hmm. the door would be open and somebody mm-hmm. would say, welcome, won't you take a seat? And, you know, then. So I I do believe we have to work for things. We can't expect everything to just open like that. Mm -hmm. But when it flows like that, it's a go. And and that to me is a big, big thing about trust, trusting Mm -hmm. that you're put where you're supposed to be. If you wake up with the intent to be put where you're supposed to be, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, it makes all the sense in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Tell us a little bit about your spiritual social club. Do you, uh, do you have a speaker at that or is it just, uh, you know, a, a social time to talk about spiritual topics? Well, we so it, there, it's now taken on a life of its own. It started in COVID as a Zoom with a different psychic medium or healer uh-huh. and myself as the facilitator and everybody in the Zoom would be 15 tops because I tried doing it like 40 people and I feel like so impersonal, yeah. too many questions. Like I want everyone to be able to have time with the expert and everyone to be able to get a, a reading and everyone to be able to ask questions. Mm-hmm. So that's the Zoom portion of Spiritual Social Club. And they could either be authors, like we've had Carol and Mace on, we've had mm-hmm. Rebecca Rosen on, we've had, or or like I talked about earlier in this in this conversation, people who are totally off the radio, radar, who have no books, no TV shows, they're just incredible healers, like Prajna Avalon in Brazil is amazing healer, or great mediums or psychics, you know, I, I have so many of them now. And for some reason, most of them seem to be in Long Island, there's something in the water in Long Island, there's no doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we do these intimate zooms. But now that we're back in person, mm-hmm. I have, I have a spiritual social club coming up in Long Island on June 5th, I have one once a month here in the Chicago area in person, you know, at this place called Madame Zuzu's, which is Billy Corgan's tea shop. He's a, a musician with the Smashing Pumpkins. He's very spiritual. We're old friends. So mm-hmm. I have a different person come there um, once a month. So we're now meeting in person at the Spiritual Social Club, but mm-hmm. it started as a Zoom community. And now uh, the lesson in lunch is part of the Spiritual Social Club. You know, uh, we call it the Spiritual Saddle Club now. <laughs> so I see, I see. It's, Yeah, it's just like minded people getting together, whether it's in person or whether it's on Zoom. The concept is finding your tribe, being with like minded others, Mm -hmm. learning how they work um, and connecting the dots for what's missing in your life or what you want more of in Mm -hmm. your life. It's not always about what's missing, but what you want to bring in. And, um, and, you know, I find that now you can thanks to Zoom. If there's one good thing about the last couple of years, this social club 
has let me connect to people in Australia and the UK and yeah. Canada. So people are joining from everywhere. Whereas before you had to live within, you know, drivable range to be yeah. at one of my events, or I had to come to them, which I used to do, but now everybody can meet virtually, which is like, here we are. I'm in Chicago. You guys are wherever you are. And that's a wonderful thing that this connection has oh, given us with this virtual. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah it's been wonderful for us too. It's just broadened our, it's broadened, yeah, uh, the audience, but it's also broadened who I can invite, you know, right. I didn't exactly. have to ask you to come to uh, New York or Boulder or anywhere else. Right, right? which I would have done. I mean, and, and yeah. I spent a lot of time doing those kinds of things, but now yeah. it's just easy to, with a click, we can all be together. It's quite yeah. nice. It is great. Mm-hmm. Um can you tell us a little bit about it in your book, which I haven't read yet, but I'm going to uh, stay tuned conversations with dad from the other side. It's described as both heartbreaking and soul strengthening. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your posthumous relationship with your dad and, and is it still going on and how has it affected you? Well, as a, a person who was skeptical and didn't believe that I could talk with my dad from the other side, but now here I am, you know, several mm-hmm. years later, and I know for sure that he is getting a real kick out of this. Um, but we do, I, I know that he, um, as we talked about earlier with our birth plan, mm-hmm. I know we signed up to be teammates and on the same team. Mm-hmm. And with his branch points and his life choices, he took an earlier exit then maybe had he stayed to work on some things that he could have faced, but didn't, right? We all have challenges that we can either face or come back again later, do again. But I know um, were he still alive, I wouldn't be on this Zoom with you. I wouldn't have gone down this path. Mm -hmm. And so I know I was meant to go on this path and he was meant to exit early and sort of be a co-pilot, if you will. What was heartbreaking is that we didn't, you know, we didn't become close until he got sick, really. I mean, he was the fun dad. He wasn't like the Monday through Friday homework dad. Mm -hmm. He was, my parents were divorced and um, you know, I joke that they married different people every seven years. (laughs) It's just (laughs) like, it's hard to keep track. My family tree leads a Sharpie and a dry erase (laughs) board, but he um, and I became very close later on when I chose writing and, and journalism too, because, you know, it's like people, people do what they know, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of families have lawyers and doctors and whatever in our family, we just seem to have this through line of journalists and writers. And um, it was like all I knew, really. And, and while I wanted to try to do other things, I wound up doing what I was good at, like we talked about earlier, doing what your soul's purpose is, is right. I'm a storyteller, when, and whatever that platform might be, whether it's in writing, or on the stage or on a live Zoom, or um on the radio show, it doesn't matter as long as we're communicating and connecting heart to heart. That's what matters to me. Mm -hmm. And I know that now, and Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known that if I dad were still alive, I would probably still be standing in a snowstorm saying it's snowing back to you, Mm -hmm. you know, at (laughs) CBS, because that's what my life was. And I didn't think it had to be anything else. I didn't know there was anything else to do other than go to work, come home, get a paycheck, have a family, maybe if you're lucky, you know, all those things. So I think so the, the pandemic has had a lot of people reassessing what they were doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So yes, my, my father, the heartbreaking part was that, you know, in that book, stay tuned, he, he passes away and there's a reflection of, of, of the relationship and how that worked, but, but the, the growth begins and then, you know, how he shows up. I mean, I, I basically went all over the country to try to find a medium that was, val- was, was, going to help me because once I realized this wasn't a scam and that it was real, Mm -hmm. then I wanted to have a conversation with him like really bad. (laughs) So then I was like, Oh wait, this is real. I need to find somebody who can help me communicate with him. And then that's the, that's the conclusion of of the book. So it it really was quite a journey. And that was the first book of the, of the journey. I see. I see. Uh Uh-huh. And, and so you found, uh, you were able to have um, a, a, a conversation with him through the- different mediums. I mean, he hasn't shut up now. And, and the whole time I'm doing this work, he's very chatty. Um, uh, but you, now you're able to hear him directly. No, just, no. I, I can't, I, I don't have 
that people are like, oh, are you now a medium? You've interviewed so many of them, or are you taking classes or whatever? Mm -hmm. I have definitely learned to broaden my skill set. Let's just say mm -hmm. that I encourage people always to listen to their intuition. Your first thought is your best thought. Don't overthink it. You know, really the toolbox of intuition is something I'm fascinated by. I had it a lot as a kid, you know, more, more so as a kid, um, but was, you know, I had this, my stomach, I could, I could get a gut feeling on things. And I, mm. and I would talk to my, my mom about it. And then she took me to the doctor and the doctor said I was making it up for, for attention. So mm. that shut that down and any sort of clear audience or clear sentience, I guess it was, it was more of a clear sentient because I was feeling it in my body. Mm -hmm. So now I, I've talked with my team, right? The big guys upstairs and my other side and my dad. And I say, you know, if it's a yes, I need a physical reaction and I get a goosebump as a yes. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and if it's a no, I need interference and interference means the zoom breaks down, the phone doesn't work, the schedules get wonky, you know? So that is my no. And I, and I, I've interviewed this woman, Pat Longo, wonderful healer who uh, teaches a lot of these people. Um, she wrote the best-selling book, The Gifts Beneath Your Anxiety. And she believes that all these kids are being medicated with anxiety or really just, you're not sick, you're psychic. Yeah. And this is, this is a, a, an epidemic. And she talks about how you can have sort of like a symbol library that you work on. So uh, if you're talking to somebody and they're having a challenge with say somebody with addiction, then like, I'll see somebody in my family, like in my mind's eye who mm -hmm. has addiction. Mm -hmm. And that's my sort of clairvoyant, I guess it's called clairvoyance, but I, I don't really, it's like a movie plays out in my head a little bit. And I think everybody here on the zoom probably has it where you could close your eyes and picture the kitchen of the house where you grew up, right. Mm -hmm. You know, as a kid, and you can picture how the lilac tree smelled outside and the dog barked outside and that whole sensory experience. That's a clear buoyant experience, a clear sentient experience. You're just kind of recalling the way you felt and saw on at, at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed now over the, especially the last five years, I will get these little, I, I guess they're clairvoyant little movies that play out mm -hmm. where I'm driving and all of a sudden I'll see a friend and I'm thinking about her and I'm like, gosh, I wonder what she's up to. And then I follow through with that. And I call and I find out she's in crisis or she's in distress. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, I'm spiritual damn it. My second book where I talk about having a really bad feeling about a babysitter that I left my son in, in her care, but she was highly recommended. So on paper, she looked amazing, but my body was saying, mm. Mm. but I was late, I had to go. So I got in the car and I'm driving to this event and I realized I forgot my phone at home, hmm. Blackberry at the time. This is a, a, And I turned around and boy, if that babysitter wasn't getting herself a Tito's and lemonade, a little vodka, 16 year old pouring the vodka. And I was like, ah. so I took my son with me to that event, <laughs> but you know, yeah. our body is there to tell us. And I am lately now listening to that, whereas it wasn't honored for a long time in my life as a young, young child. Yeah. And you don't talk about that kind of stuff in the newsroom at all. But isn't it interesting when you have a hunch about a story and they say, you know, what's your hunch? What does your gut say? You know, you're allowed to follow your gut when mm -hmm. it comes to chasing a lead for a story if it's investigative reporting, but you can't trust your gut when it comes to anything else. It's so yeah. it's so weird. It is weird. And I think that we all hear guidance yeah. and we just don't recognize it. Uh, we don't recognize it as such, mm -hmm. you know, we think it's our own voice. I know that was the case with me. I had no idea until, you know, my medium friend told me, you know, your grandfather is watching you all the time during our meditation. And right. there's this surgeon standing next to you. And I said, well, how do you know he's a surgeon? And he said, because he has a tray of surgical instruments next to him. And I said, well, what does he look like? And he said, he described him. And I thought, that sounds like my grandfather who died before I was born. Right. And I remembered that as a very small child, I had lost three of my grandparents before I was born. My parents married late, had me late, you know. And um, so I had one grandmother and I didn't know anything about any of these other grandparents who had died. My parents really never talked about them. Right. And, um, but I remembered, you know, when I, when I started thinking about him, I remembered that as a small child, I knew 
that this one grandfather was always around me and always watching over me and making sure I was okay. Yeah. And I don't know how I knew that because I don't remember, I don't remember seeing him. I don't remember hearing him, but you know, little kids, they don't, they don't analyze how they know something. They just know yes, it. No. Yeah. And I knew that about this one grandfather and he was the surgeon. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, then I started listening Mm -hmm. And at first I was very resistant. I was a very poor student uh, of, you know, learning to hear my guide. Mm -hmm. um, my poor grandfather had to go to extreme means to convince me that, you know, that, that I was hearing him. And because I was so skeptical about my own ability to do that, you know, yeah. and um, I mean, I knew my friend could do it. That was his department. It wasn't my department, you know. And but I had some very dramatic situations where he even saved my life. Mm -hmm. And had I not listened, and even then, I, you know, I, I, I had this one situation where there was, um, I was on this dark road in the mountains in the woods. And, uh, and it, it was a very dark night, there was no moon and and I um, don't know my way, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how to get through this, the woods back to the main road. And suddenly I hear, stop the car. Mm. And, and I thought, stop the car here? No, right. you know, why would I want to stop the car? And all I heard was stop the car. And it kept repeating and repeating. And mm -hmm. And, and I took my foot off the accelerator and I'm kind of slowing down, but I really don't want to stop the car because it was creepy to think of myself sitting there in the dark wood, woods late at night. And, and so I'm saying things like, well, how about when we get to Route 28, then I'll stop the car, you know, and all I could hear is stop the car, stop the car. And so I was going slower and slower and slower and still trying to get out of this and still questioning why should I stop the car? And finally, I'm just inching along after about, I don't know, half a mile or so, you know, um, I'm inching along and all of a sudden, all these deer come out of the woods, single file, Wow! charge across the road in front of my car. And had I been going any faster, I would have had a really bad collision. And as it was the last one in line, there were, I don't know, somewhere between three and five deer. And the last one kind of grazed her shoulder on, on my fender, but I think she was okay. She kept right. running and she was okay. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, okay. So it was a few situations like that where I really, I knew it wasn't my, my thought because right. the last thing I wanted to do was stop. Was the, that, yeah. That was divine guidance. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. of course. And, uh, and that was how I learned with sit with a variety of situations like that. Um, I finally, realized, okay, I, I have to listen, because he's always right. And, right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and years later, I'm, I met this friend when I was living in Colorado, and I met this friend, and, and we were talking about these things. And she said to me, you know, the other day, I was leaving the house, and this was July, and I was leaving the house and, and this, um, and my guide said to me, go in and get your gloves. Well, the only kind of gloves she had was winter gloves. So had it been me, I would have said, why do I need gloves? You know, but she didn't. She just she just got out of the car, went into the house. It took her 10 minutes to find her gloves. And she brought her gloves with her in the car and took off where she was heading. And she gets to this intersection and there's a big pile up. And mm. she would have been part of that pile up. Yeah. Had she not gotten back in the house to get her gloves. Right. And I said to her, your guide has it easy because your guide just tells you what to do and you do it. My guide has to start half a mile back telling me to stop the car because it takes me that because I'm so stubborn. But I, I learned, I finally learned not to be stubborn and, and not to, um, you know, and to trust and know that uh, the guidance was there for me and, and it is such a gift. It yeah. really is such a gift. And yeah, you're not alone. It gets so frustrated with us too as humans because we doubt it. And and exactly I mean, this year, I think it was January where I experienced a I mean a complete miracle. I was 
praying for something and you know it was it was just something was going on it was very personal with everything that was happening and I I was just at a standstill like it was just like all right uncle I don't know what I don't know what and I was curled up in a ball and I had been um sort of adopted in this prayer group that Carolyn Mace we were doing with just a few people and I was raised Christian mm-hmm. depending who my dad was married to at the time but um we didn't have, you know, there was no rosaries in my house or anything like that. And and so I know Carolyn comes from a Catholic background and, and I have, a, I do too. Yeah. It's respect for that. Of course. And, but I just, she's like, you're going to join this rosary circle. And I, I was like, okay, how does that work? You know, she's like, Jen, you want to start? I'm like, you go ahead. You know, I had no idea what, you know, what's a decade, what? So I had to learn how to do a rosary. So for that Christmas, I actually got a rosary and And so now I actually like the repetitiveness of it because it's sort of like a meditation. It kind of gets me out of my monkey mind and you start and you say it. And so, so here I was clutching this rosary and I was, I was in deep, deep prayer and, um, and all the way in Arizona, Carolyn was doing the rosary at that exact moment with a friend Mm -hmm. and she came to and had seen my face and literally, so she caught my prayer. Like I've never, I've never heard of this happening and she caught it and Mm. she caught the prayer and then she called me and it was just, and then it was, the solution came and I just couldn't believe it. I was so blown away by the fact that it worked. You know, it was like, I've heard about it. I've interviewed people. They've told me their stories. I'm like, oh, that's great. Good for you. (laughs) Let me go type it up and I'll write about it. But there was an actual encounter. And so that then blew my circuits that I always knew that we were connected and we all had antenna, but when you really, that was the power of a heartfelt prayer. You know, I interviewed PMH Atwater, who I'm sure you've heard of, maybe you've heard of, she does a lot of research on near death experiences with young children. Yeah. And she talks about the young, young children having the same story about when they, when they talked about when they were on the other side, they mm-hmm. could see that a prayer that went from the person doing the praying to the recipient, a heartfelt prayer traveled like a rainbow. It looked like mm-hmm. a rainbow going from the heart of the prayer to the, mm-hmm. the prayee. And it, and, and these little t- three-year-olds telling these stories, you know, that, that to me is like, wow. Cause they're not going on YouTube and comparing notes and going to the library and seeing what other people say about near death experiences. Like mm-hmm. this is their story. So I think about that often and how many, rainbows are we putting out you know a heartfelt prayer from your heart to someone else's is received yes, and i it is received and i i know this now i didn't i had, i think i'm one of those people i'm one of those learners that has to experience it to get it you know mm-hmm. and i think maybe my team knows that like guys she's not gonna get the memo <laughs> <laughs> i um yeah i i tell my students that if you're having a conflict with someone mm-hmm. just bless them and pray for them because you will switch, you will shift the energy. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how it does that. You right. know, mm-hmm. Just, uh, prayer is very Excellent. powerful. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, I think I, I want to uh, give people a chance to ask you some questions. Also, I have tons of uh, topics that, uh, that I would love to cover with you, but I do want to um, open it up in case uh, someone in attendance has a question. And so let's do that and um, see if someone does. Yes, please. I'd love to hear any questions anybody has. I don't see any in the chat. Nope. So. um, Okay, Linabelle. I'll just say, um, I love your, your interviews. I love your stories. I just, I just, I listen to them over and over and I read them and it's just so interesting to get the um, the broad spectrum that you bring because people are all different, you know, and they're all see things in a little bit different, but you think of the best things to say to people and the best responses. And as Gloria said, you bring some humor to it and you just think of the best things to say. So I just want to say, I'm really enjoying oh. seeing you in person. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. I told, I told Gloria, whoever's supposed to be here will be here. And there's no, that's, that's how every day is. And, and thank you. That really made my day because honestly, (laughs) we were at the lesson and lunch, we were doing one on Monday 
And the woman who runs the horse farm says, okay, so what are you going to say to the, to the class? And I said, I don't know yet. And she goes, what do you mean you don't know yet? I said, I don't. I just trust that the words that I'm supposed to say and the stories I'm supposed to share are the ones that the room needs to hear at that time. And she rolled her eyes. And she goes, I don't know how you work like this. <laughs> like, but now I've gotten comfortable with that, um, with that formula. So thank you for saying that. Because even when I do those interviews, I don't have, you know, I, I look at Oprah and I see these people with their notepad and, their, and I don't. I have all the information in my noggin and I trust that what's supposed to come out comes out. And, and that's how I like it because I believe spirit's got a better plan than anything I could put on paper. Well, you've got so much experience and you've got so much knowledge and everything that you've just got lots of different ways you could go. So, right. Well, thank you for, for saying that. And, and had my dad not passed, I'm sorry, dad, but had, I wouldn't have any of this knowledge. I really wouldn't have. So even the worst circumstances can take us down a journey that we don't realize are for our best and highest good. Right. You know, that's the part that's so wild. So thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, I have a question, Jen. Yeah. Um, recently, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos of people who are channelers uh -huh. And, um, and sometimes I questioned, I go, oh, does this resonate with me? Because maybe they're just saying something that sounds really good, you know, that I agree with, or, um, is it because it is, you know, really coming from a, a true channel, I guess, and so because you've gone through talking to so many people, and I think you said that sometimes you, you do run into frauds, but you don't report it. Right. I'm just wondering, like, what, um, how do, how have you discerned? Because um, in this case, I, I, I feel like I go, oh, I, I, I really, um, I agree with everything. And then, you know, like, you're like, is this, is this real? And right. that thing. So, well, so I've, I've come into frauds, but they can still be really good at mediumship, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Right. So like I was talking about earlier about finding your source, whether it's from the dark or from the light, whether you're Darth Vader or you're Luke Skywalker, they can be very, very talented, but it can be a, from a dark source. So I have seen some channelers um, and I, I I would ask them, what is their source, right? What are they going to for their messages and how do they get there? Because there can be, and I've seen this happen. Like I literally, there was a, a, a person that I worked with for several years was working from a light source and then something switched, her personality switched. There was darkness in her eyes and and her personality was different. Everything that was coming out of her mouth was different. And I was like, oh my God, she's been rented. Like literally like a dark energy went into her and she, she was not there anymore. I don't know what happened to her. So I would never trust a channeler that I don't know already what their source is, what their, what their routine is, what their protocol, you know, do they come recommended from other people that I know and trust? You know, it's kind of like putting your, your trust in, like we were talking about earlier with a babysitter or a doctor or, or a therapist, you know, who is this person? Because just opening yourself up to get a channel without the proper protocol of calling in the highest vibration, I always say master level or above, like no, no, no trickster board spirit. That's like, like you work with Gloria, not in the light, but looking for a, you know, there are a lot of energies that are looking for a puppet. And, and unfortunately I found that out the hard way, you know, Ouija boards. I'm not a fan I'm pendulums. I think they can be manipulated. I really think if you're not in um, a, a meditative source like space, so um, also to alcohol and drugs, if, if, if somebody's using those, that, that's opening yourself wide open for rentals, yeah. you know, your, your, your energy field, if you're a practicing healer, psychic or medium, and you're at the bar drinking a lot of Chardonnay, and then you're going over here and doing readings, I have a problem with that, because I think that that opens you to the source of different energies. So I don't know who you're watching, Maria, because I would just say like, what's their protocol? What's their source, you know? Um, and what's their message? And what's their message? Yeah, well, the message was, was positive and the message resonated. But right. when he changed from 
um, when he changed from whatever himself to the channel, uh -huh. he looked weird. And I'm like going, oh, maybe I shouldn't judge, you know, his right. appearance because I that's just part of mm -hmm. how he looks when he channels. Right. Um Anyway, it's just curious because I, you know, so m whenever you see people channeling, they they usually channel with a different voice, with a right. different personality, and um, that depends, um, Maria. It okay, depends, it depends a lot on the um, the channel, mm -hmm. yeah. and it also depends a lot on the spirit talking through the channel. Mm -hmm. uh, the the better channels, the more, um, uh, you know, experienced ones mm -hmm. have less of a change when they're talking, when, when the spirit is talking through them, than like a newer one, a less experienced one will have, um, you know, but it depends. I mean, if you're channeling a, a very troubled spirit, you're not going to sound the way you normally do, you know, and, um, you know, my mentor, uh, Al Chivu in Brazil, uh, he, when he was channeling one of his guides, he channeled several guides and one of them was a German doctor. And when he channeled him, you could hardly tell that, that he, that you couldn't really see, uh, the switch, you know, you could hardly tell mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that he was channeling, except you'd hear a slight German accent mm -hmm. when he would say his R's. And then when he channeled another guy that he had, who was, who had been Portuguese, he was from Portugal, a doctor. Um, when he channeled him, he would have his eyes closed all the time. The whole time he was channeling him, his eyes would be closed and he spoke with a thick Portuguese accent. Right. And so, um, yeah, so it really varies a lot. You can't really, you know, go by, um, but, but usually it's very, if it's a higher spirit and if it's an accomplished medium, there really isn't a lot of drama around, you know, the, you know, the, the language and the, um, the message. Things and things. Yeah. And the message will be of a higher nature. And that's really the most important thing you should be watching for. The message was of a high nature. Um, and it resonated with me. And um, anyway, I, I tried to listen and trust how you got to it too. Right. Like, so if you're asking, for messages from the divine, from your team, right? For your highest good. And then say, show me the, the channeler who's going to give me those messages for the master level and above for my highest good. Like, you know, trust the process of how you even found them. You know what I mean? And then, and then listen to your body. And what does it feel like when you watch them? Like you said, you, you judged when they, their face changed, but what if you just listened to the words and didn't watch the video, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then feel that in your body. Right. I, I did. I, I, uh, I ended up closing my eyes and just listening. And um, yeah, so. Yeah, I think it's all personal, right? Everyone's got a method and, and a theory, but some people just go down the rabbit hole of, like, of searching all and any channels on YouTube and stuff. And I, and I get that because sometimes you just want to see what, what you like and what resonates for you. Um, but I always go with the ones that are recommended, you mm -hmm. know, by, by people that I know and trust and that they, they, you know, they've had good experiences with, but trust your body. You're your best gauge. You know, mm -hmm. you are the powerful vessel that you are that will be able to tell you if that's, if that's good, you know, I hope that helps. Maybe it just, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Jen. Yeah. I, uh, I need to trust myself more. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's the bumper sticker. We all do. <laughs> Anybody else? I was just going to say, I read your um, I'm Spiritual Damn It about a year ago and just loved it. It was so delightful. And then when I heard you were coming here, then I got the Medium Psychics and Channelers, the first one, I guess. And oh, Medium Psychics and Channelers. Those are the podcast interviews. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what Gloria was reading, that's something separate. Psychics, Mediums, and Healers is a 
is a book that's also an audio book. I, I do okay. all audio books too. You know, I think I there thought I was getting that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't read anymore. I just listen. Right. It's all audio book anyway. Yeah. Book? <laughs> yeah. I just, like, I just so cool. appreciate you doing your work because you oh, are just a natural. I mean, I know you're a journalist, but you, you do ask great questions and you just, you're just a really good interviewer. And I appreciate that. And what was I going to say? I forget what else. But anyway, keep up the good work. Oh, I was going to say, it's funny you lost your dad. He was 56. My mom was 56. And and then and that's what put me on my spiritual journey, too. And I'm finding that a lot is that like death is a really good kick in the pants for a lot of people. <sighs> for sure. You know, another kick in the pants uh, last April. Um, one of my closest friends from childhood passed away. She was diagnosed on on uh, St. Patrick's Day with cancer and by tax day, she was gone like less than a month and she was 50 and she left behind two kids. And it was just, it was just, it took the wind out of me. I mean, my dad's death took the wind out of me too, but this was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like what? She was the healthy one. She was the one that got her, you know, got her checkups before anybody else. And, you know, she was, she was on it and she was into wellness and, and health. And it just so seemed like, wait a minute, there is no reason for this. There's no rhyme or reason for this. And so when I was going into that whole thing, you know, I, I was talking to her spirit, like, and she starts messing with lights and she's now she's in all my spiritual social clubs. She shows up. Her spirit is one. Of, like, she's like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Like she was the CFO of her company. She was in charge of, uh, like she was misorganized. And so of course she's going to master this skill now of communicating from the other side, but <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, I have goosebumps now. There she is. That's my, <laughs> like all over my body. Wow. They're like, oh. So, so yes, you're so good at this. She's just a little show off now. And I, and because she shows up like that for me when I'm talking to this guy while I'm driving and, and I'm in a different space now than when my dad first died and I was much younger and I wasn't sure what the heck this all meant. And I needed this evidence to be built up, built, built up, built up. Well, now here I am. And, and all these years later and all these conversations later, you know, I, I know a little bit more about the other side of the veil and so I think it makes it easier to receive when you're in that state, you know, you don't have to get through, you don't have to slog through so many layers yeah. of the onion. So, um, and, and are you a healer? Cause I see that beautiful, the chakras behind you on the wall there, Kathy. So what oh, well, doing? I'm i uh, I'm with Gloria. I'm on the healing team with her oh. and, and I do the disobsession work and things like nice. that. So okay. great. And, uh, but what was I going to ask you? Well, with your friend dying and then I'm sure it was a shock. But do you get the feeling that people leave when they're supposed to leave? And yeah, uh, and that it- I, I, I'm still trying to figure out why she had to exit when she did. Um, and so I, I wrestle with that a little bit. Like, really, she chose this. Like when we were talking about our destiny points and our branch points, like really, this was her exit. Like she was going to go exit stage left before all this other stuff was completed. And I, I don't understand it. Um, I, I feel like maybe a couple of years later, I might have a better understanding because mm-hmm. um, she hasn't said like, you know, she hasn't given a message, but she's she uh-huh. asked like, why? And she said that it was my, you know, she's out of pain, which was so wonderful because at the end she was in so much pain. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just, it's just so confusing, you know, to have that kind of loss mm-hmm. uh, and her, her partner, her husband having that kind of loss and her adorable kids who are my son's age. Like this is just like, uh, um, and so it just sort of takes you back to center and go, okay, I'm really glad I'm still here. And I'm going to, so I went then because of her passing, every one of us and our friends of friends of friends went and got every test you could imagine. And I mean, I got all my lab work done and I found out I'm, I'm, I'm scarily low in so many things, D and B and A and K and, you know, T cells and like, you know, the, the stress levels really took its toll and I got COVID twice, all these things. Oh goodness. So, you know, I, I needed to get a, get a reboot anyway in my immune system. And so now it's changed my trajectory and everybody in her life has changed their trajectory too. So, you know, if, if any of this, and then because my dad stepped out and then I've done all these interviews and, and here you are talking about how they helped you, you know, Lana Bell and Kathy and, and, and Gloria, that mm-hmm. if that, if that, was part of it, then that's part of it, I guess. 
right? Mm-hmm. That, that we have to have these losses that bring us to our knees so that then we can tell the stories that help others stand and rise so that they can walk. Yeah. And, you know, if there really is no death and it's just the other side of the veil and they're right there giving us signs and signals that they're with us, you know, um, yeah. then gosh, what a, what a dance we're all doing. Right. <laughs> and I think it deepens, it deepens our understanding of life and yeah. ourselves and, you know, uh, who was it recently? Um, somebody, I was reading something or I was listening to something and they said the capital sin of America is superficiality. Oh yeah. And you know, and and I thought, wow, uh, I can you know I can relate to that because I I see a lot. You know, I mean, it's like bread and circuses. You know, keep them entertained and keep them. And and um, when something like that happens, you know, just like a near death experience, just like a shared death experience. It just uh, makes us think about, you know, things differently and and uh, with a little more depth and a little more compassion and a little more, you know, as Carol May says, on the other hand, you can get bitter or you can get better, right? right. And uh, so we have that choice also because there are people who resist it to the point that they're, you know, they're more bitter than better, but um, but it's the opportunity for growth, for sure. Absolutely. I see Alan's got his hand raised. Hi, oh, Alan. Hello. Thank you. Um, I have a very limited experience with channeling, uh-huh. and I haven't read your books. But I'm curious because I lost my father when I was very young. I was nine. I've always wanted to uh, establish some kind of a dialogue conversation with him and uh, my question is what conditions can i put myself in to be more receptive to allow to allow for dialogue across the veil i know it's a big question yeah no no i i love that question i've recently been exploring with the process of automatic writing and and again it all goes back to first of all setting the intention like i was saying with maria Mm -hmm getting yourself in a steady place, calling in the light, all of your angels, guides, master level and above, whatever deity you pray to, whatever, if that's that's Mm -hmm. something, but calling in that light vibration. So you know, first of all, what your audience is, right? Right. So so you've got your source, boom, that's step one. Then I would also do a grounding, I picture a grounding cord going from the base of my spine and then each of my feet clawing into earth I, I lately have been picturing a, a cord because I love um, the look of this amethyst rock that I have. So I picture a giant amethyst literally at the bottom, like an anchor holding mm. the cord going from the base of my spine and each of my feet. And then that amethyst charging back up and putting energy into my legs. So if you're sitting, picture your legs. If you're lying down, just picture it just, you know, grounding you to the earth. And then I ask, I, I turn on my light tight and bright. That's how I remember it. Cause it rhymes. I turn on my light tight and bright. And it's literally like picturing this, this, see this light here. Right. Like, boom. You turn on your light and it emanates out like a foot on all sides, sort of like a glowing mm. egg. And then with that intention, I ask, I hold the pen and the paper and I say, what do you want me to know? How can I communicate to? And then I write down the name of the person I want to communicate to, or, or if you want to communicate to your guides or whatever it is, and then write without agenda. Even if it's like sunshine, lollipops, rainbows, everything, just write, 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 write. And within that writing, you'll be amazed at maybe thoughts will start coming into your head because it gets you out of your head by writing and then write those thoughts. And then the floodgates will open. Or if you have a voice memo in your phone and you can, you know, you can't write fast enough. Sometimes I can't write as fast as I'm thinking. So I pull out the voice memo and I speak what I'm thinking, what comes through. Mm -hmm. You've set the stage, you've, you've welcomed in the energy for the highest level and above. And then you've asked for that conversation. Um, that's sort of what's worked for me lately. I hope that helps. I don't know that, you know, everyone's got oh, their feet, but. Well, thank you. That, that does help. Thank okay. you. I, I have done from time to time, especially with people like Otto Schammer, the mm-hmm. writing without thinking. So yeah. that you just put your, you let the, your hand write, but that's there's right. no interference. Exactly. Yeah. Even if it's just scribbling and it's not yeah. words. 
And then yeah. the words start to form because the first few times I was so in my head and then I would ask angels, guides, get me out of my head and into my heart. Boom. And then I would picture like light going out of my heart. But I'm sure, Gloria, you've probably got a process for this too. What do you recommend, Alan, try? Um, I, I, I would go along with everything you said and um, also emphasize, you know, what is your intention? Because yes. when we approach these things out of sheer curiosity, you know, uh, sometimes we invite lower, lower spirits, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so I would just, um, we, we do, you know, spiritism calls it psychography and there are different kinds. There's automatic writing where the spirit has your control of your hand and you don't even know what you're writing. It's just going a million miles an hour, you know, um, uh, then there's intuitive uh, psychography where is more like what Jen was describing, where you hear uh, words or you get images and you put it into your own words, you get concepts mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you write them down, but always, you know, make sure that the preliminary steps that Jen mentioned about, you know, asking for higher guides only, you know, and, and you're doing this for your own evolution or for someone else. Um, if they need a message, um, you know, you're doing it for higher purposes as well, right? Because, you know, when we are contacting spirit, the level of our vibrational frequency determines the level of the spirit that we're going to attract. And the way it works is that we you know, we get centered and we raise our vibration by getting centered and by calling in higher forces uh, and aligning ourselves uh, ourselves with them. Um, and then the guide who's higher, hi her frequency is much higher than ours. Mm -hmm. They step theirs down and we step ours up and we meet in the middle, you see, and that's how we make contact. So the purer my intentions are yeah. and the more I am spiritually connected and connecting, right? The higher my vibration is going to be and the higher the guide that I will attract and the better the message will be. So that's, that's. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. That's a great reminder, Gloria. I know some people will have a bottle of wine and then they want to do automatic writing. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's I, I had a friend years ago. <laughs> who uh, had done automatic writing just to see if she could do it, right? right. Mm -hmm. And she sat down and she got this message about a friend of hers. Mm -hmm. And it was a very personal message and it was kind of a secret, right? And she found out by, through, you know, whatever means, asking her friend or whatever, um, that it was true. And there was no way that she could have known this kind of dark thing about her friend. And so she was really fascinated because, because it was clearly, uh, you know, a spirit who had access to this information. And she indulged it several more times with, you know, messages about different people and stuff. And then finally, she got uncomfortable with it, which right. I think she should have been to begin with. But she, she got uncomfortable and she decided, okay, I don't want this anymore. This is not a, this is not what I should be putting this effort to. And this is not a, a very good spirit. He's gossiping about people. And, and so she said, I, you know, I want a better guide. I want somebody higher. And she could not get rid of that spirit. Every time she would sit down, because she was, it turned out she was really good at it, you know. Right. Um, but every time she would sit down and she would start writing and what would come through was, ha, 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 I'm still here. Right. And That's she, what I'm talking about with the dark energies. Like they're, they're exactly. really good and not good. You know she what I mean? <laughs> stop doing it all together because. Yeah. You know, at one point she waited two years and she thought, oh, I'm sure that spirit right. is gone. She right. sat down and it was the same thing. So right. you cannot indulge, you know, any kind well, of... Pat Longo would say that you can command them to go away because really at the end of the day, we can command our space, right? I command yeah. an energy that's not for my highest good to leave now. It, you know? my, I asked my, my mentor in Brazil, who was an incredible uh, healer and phenomenal medium, um, about that. And he said, don't ever pray against anything, 
but you ask for a higher guide. You ask your guide to take care of it, you know, but don't, but don't pray against anything because you can't force, you can't command a spirit. They have free will, you know, and the more you, you know, get excited and angry and whatever, um, the more power you give them because earthbound spirits don't have a lot of energy because they're not where they're supposed to be. So, right. right. Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to respectfully disagree with that because I, okay. I've been told that, that we can at all times decide to turn on our car or turn off our car and it is our space. And if, yes. There, yes, you know, you and if there is something that is a trickster energy, that's ha ha. No, you know, like and, and, and out, you know, yeah. like out damn spot, you know, like mm-hmm. all, okay. All kids go to bed now out, 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 yeah. you know, right. get, get out bugs. You know, I'm going to take out the raid and go. <laughs> because. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. supposedly our guides and our team will protect us because we are calling them in and saying, okay, let's, it's time to clear this out now. You know, at least that's what I've been told by, by, you know, several people who, have yeah. had whatever, well, but, you know, everyone's got their, their theory. So I don't want to kibosh it. I, I mean, I agree with you that you can say, you know, um, I don't want you anymore, yeah. but in her case, she did that and she was very adamant about it, yeah. but every she had to stop doing the writing and that's how she right. cleared her space, you know, Perfect. because every time she would try to write, it would still come through. So that's, you know, so yes, you can do something about it. You know, you don't, and it, the thing is, you know, if it's a, if it's a spirit who is, won't leave you alone, right. then just ignore it is the best thing is just to ignore it and, and ask your guides for help for sure. But, um, but it, it's in ignoring it, they usually will go away. Mm-hmm. You know? um, but yeah, so, so it was just a lesson learned on her part, you know, and. Um, yeah, I mean, that is a very, there are very bored energies, like I said, looking for mm-hmm. a puppet and they're looking for a reason to engage and, and they can right. often hook you with right information, right? Yeah. Um, they do it through affinity. It's not random. Right, so right. if your energy is high, if your frequency is high, your vibration is right. high, you're not going to attract those. If right. your if your motives are good and your intentions are good, you right. know, and you're coming exactly. from a good place, you don't have to worry. Exactly. You yeah, like you say, putting out the fear. I have I have people that like won't leave the house if they if they come back, not won't leave the house. They won't they won't go to sleep if they haven't saged every room and corner of the house. So they're like putting all this fear energy into like, yeah. oh, I didn't sage the car. I didn't <laughs> sage the dog. I didn't, you know, it's like, okay, so then there's so much like energy into like, oh, I didn't do this. So now I'm little and it's like, you got to live your life and you got to remember that, you know, sometimes I just go light shower and it's like picturing a shower, just like literally uh, James Van Prague says he puts a, a reminder in his phone several mm-hmm. times a day, just go light shower. Just because when you're walking unconsciously through a crowded space, you mm-hmm. are a lint roller you, you take, <laughs> you know, and you're putting it on that rug with the lady who has five cats. Like that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. If you're unconscious and you don't have, you know, an umbrella in the rainstorm, mm-hmm. you're just walking and you're going to get wet. And so then it's like, okay, I got to go in the dryer really quick. So mm-hmm. I just say light shower. And it's literally just picturing like that. Yeah. I write yeah. about this and damn it, um, my, uh-huh. I'm damn it, like that flash dance bucket, you know, where it's like, Tsh! you know, she's <laughs> like doing the dance sequence. <laughs> so that, that that's it. Just, yeah, <laughs> just do that. Um, we do that. Um, in the in the healing work and in the disobsession work, we we do what we call an auto pass. Uh-huh. And it's you know just kind of like a shower. You're yeah. you're you're just sweeping yep. your whole body. You know forces of light, forces of peace, forces right. of love, divine forces vibrating, vibrating, vibrating. Yeah. And it gives me a chill every time I do it. It's uh, great. It, I mean, and I tell people too, like, I'll literally go like this, love, light, health, wealth, joy, bliss, happiness, love, light, health, wealth, joy, <laughs> bliss, happiness. You know, it's like whatever you, whatever makes you, then sometimes it's this and sometimes it's this. And just picturing it always being light and always being healing and soothing. Mm-hmm. And, and with that, like you talk about, Gloria, intention is mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. You know, and if your intention is to clear the space, clear the dark energy, clear whatever, you know, sludge might have decided to, 
you know, um, show up. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, this is a space for healing and love. And so it is. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, nothing that, you know, can penetrate that if you put up that vibration, you know, it's just a different vibration. And I'm, I'm learning about that frequencies and vibration and all of these things. Everything is a frequency. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I leave the house, I put, I ask A L E X A. I'm not going to say the word because it'll start going <laughs> to play classical music. And and so my dog sits in a vibration of beautiful classical music while I'm out running mm-hmm. errands or doing whatever. And then I walk back in and it feels better because mm-hmm. that vibration was emanating in the space. And that's a real thing. You know, another thing they say that dark energies can't live in, um, you know, peaceful, mm-hmm. like if you have comedy or, or, you know, beautiful classical music, that vibration cannot store or house darkness you know because they're they're not even in the same building they're not just different floors they're not in the same building so you know um every every choice we make can bring some sort of higher vibration and it's also like we can't think that if we don't think about it we're bad because that's when it gets tricky you know i believe you can go have a martini and god's still gonna love you (laughs) it's gonna be absolutely yeah absolutely (laughs) Yes, Alan. Uh, you have another. I have another quick question. If we have uh, a few more minutes, uh, I am the only man in this uh, virtual room. Is that your experience uh, when you do your uh, conferencing that men are less attracted to this subject? And if yes, why? <laughs> Good question. I do find that it is mo- majority women, um, and. That's unfortunate because consciousness is universal and it should be celebrated by all sexes. Um, but usually in my social clubs, they'll be like, you know, I would say 10, 15% men and the rest women. And I don't know why. It's so, sort of like the mediumship and healers are mostly women, but there's a small percentage of men that do it. Sure. Um, is it something with our wiring? I don't know. Um, I definitely. Yeah, Peters also said that. Uh, 85% of the shared death experiences that he, that, that are reported to him are women also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do think there is something with, and I would love to ask my doctor friends this, but with our, with our brain wiring, there are different lobes that women have more receptive than the male um, construct of the brain. And I'd love to get the specifics on that. So thank you, Alan, you've given me some homework. Yeah, I, I, my sense is that this was not true of indigenous cultures. I agree. No, I agree. There is something about the Western uh, 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 emphasis on men are there to act, to be decisive, to yeah, etc. That we we may have atrophied that capacity yes. f- from the from you know through education, parenting, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, that uh, in uh, ways that other cultures didn't. Right. That's right. You're absolutely right. And in the indigenous cultures, they didn't banish the feminine aspect of the divine. And right. that made a huge difference when, when they acknowledge that. It's like acknowledging you have a right side of your brain, not just a left side of your brain, right? Mm-hmm. But our culture is so centered on left brain thinking, linear thinking, you know, that... Uh, and it's, it's very patriarchal, and we need to uh, we need to change that. We need yes. to start to integrate this, you know, the feminine divine, the fem- yeah. feminine yeah. divinity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say something to. Is it Alain? Um, how do you in, pronounce in, your name? In French, it's Alain, and Alain, Alain in English is fine. Alain. Um, Alan, I just wanted to say you that um, I know Gloria and Jen talked about, you know, writing, Mm -hmm. um, but my husband, his dad passed away when he was nine. Mm -hmm. And um, so we somebody just told us, you know, to take his picture and we actually lit a candle. Mm-hmm. Like in front of his picture. Yes. And this is an anecdote. I'm, I'm just saying it because it happened to my husband. His dad came through in his dreams. Very so, nice. um, so I just wanted to mention that as another potential art alternative yes. um, for 
you know, communicating or getting some sort of message or question answered, Mm -hmm. um, just because it happened to my husband. And then I wanted to say that I recently went to a meeting here in Denver. Mm -hmm. um, And I told Gloria about it, it was um, a combination of a near death experience and a spiritual healing Mm -hmm. together. And I would tell you it was about 50-50, if not more men than women. Wow. And so that was very surprising. And yeah. the host of the event was a man. Ah, the good. man who shared his home. Yeah. And that was surprising too. So that that's a great point, Maria. Thank you. Because the near-death experiencers definitely, I would say, and most of my interviews in that audio book, uh, doctors in near death experience are men. Uh-huh. So Raymond Moody, man, mm-hmm. you know, um, Edgar Casey, we were talking about him earlier. Yeah. Man. So, so Even there man, are definitely, a, yeah, some male trailblazers. Is a good case in point. Evan Alexander. Oh, Evan Alexander, of course. Yes, yes, yes. And like we talked about Paul Selig earlier, another mm-hmm. great channel. So, so yeah, here's hoping that it, it it starts evening out more. And I love the idea, Maria, of the candle. That's a, a great reminder yes. too, because mm-hmm. that energy it holds energy with the intention um, of lighting a candle and and with the picture, because then you're asking mm-hmm. that vibration to to be held for as long as the the candle is lit. You know, mm-hmm. and I like to get the tiny candles so I can leave them burning until they burn themselves out. Yeah. You know, um, I wouldn't encourage leaving burning candles like after you leave the house. <laughs> but I've done it before. Some people are like, you have to make sure. I it. So then I put it in the sink. So in case, you know, I leave the house like in the sink, surrounded by, you know, porcelain. <laughs> so nothing happens. But anyway. Thank you, Maria. Maria, yeah. Maria, that's very, very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great point. Ah, uh, well, uh I have topics we didn't cover, but I think we're out of time. So I'm going to um, say thank you to everyone who came and especially thank you to Jen Wagle. And um, uh, I, um, I can't wait to read another one of your books, especially the one about your dad. And and thank you for having me. I hope to see you all on a Zoom social club soon. Maybe we'll. Um, oh, that would be really oh. nice. Yeah, I, I just love, I love like minds coming together and you all have been wonderful. So thank you for your time and your focus and your community. I so appreciate you. Thank you. Jen, so I, you. I sometimes go by Chicago and my cousin lives in M- Mundelein. Anyway. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, so if there's a chance, yeah. where is this horse social club? So if you go to, um, jenweigel.com on my website there's a okay. spiritual social club tab okay. and then and then it'll say coming soon like you know there's a whole there if you go to the way bottom you know it'll give the whole calendar but it, it's in salem wisconsin salem you can remember that right the witches of salem. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes yes jenweigel.com yeah just go to jenweigel w-e-i-g-e-l.com and under the spiritual salem social. wisconsin yeah. Uh, it's called the Dietrich Farm, um, but it, there's it's under my my events. I could Thank give, you so much. yeah, I, but yeah, yeah. It's no fine. Um, I'll put I'll put your website in our in our notes too on Thank the you. YouTube channel when we post it, and I will send you the video recording as well. Fabulous. Okay. Oh, I appreciate it so much. Okay. Have a great Thank rest you. of the week. Thank buddy. you so much. Okay. Thank see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.